It is a great pleasure to, to welcome you here tonight, as well as the audience following us online, to what promises to be a memorable evening, exploring the relationship between two of the greatest artists and also two of the most complex personalities of the Italian Renaissance, Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo Buonarroti. This event is part of a major conference on Leonardo's studies, which has been taking place here today and will continue tomorrow, looking at new research into the so-called codices of Leonardo, the extraordinary uh, corpus of his writing. And two of them especially, the Codex Arundel, which is in the British Library collection here, and the Codex Leicester, which is now in the Gates Foundation. In connection with this, if after hearing Leonardo's and Michelangelo's words this evening, you want to see their actual writing, then do visit the library's treasures gallery, where three sheets from the Arundel Codex by Leonardo, alongside a draft sonnet by Michelangelo in his own hand, are on display. And my manuscripts colleague, Andrea Clark, um, also tells me that digital versions of three or four volumes, I'm not quite, I can't quite remember, of Michelangelo's letters to family members will, um, will soon be freely accessible on the British Library website. But back to this evening, uh, this evening's event, which will be a combination or fusion, perhaps, of, of formidable degrees of scholarly insight and of dramatic talent from our two, and I'm not sure of the right word here, speakers seems too tame, participants, performers, celebrants. After working for the Royal Shakespeare Company, Ruth Rosen has specialized and become very well known for her poetry and prose performances, ranging from the great romantic poets and novelists to such recent writers as Elizabeth Bishop and W.S. Graham in a range of innovative collaborations and settings. Her co-performer this evening is Martin Kemp, Emeritus Professor of the History of Art in the University of Oxford. He has long been known as one of the foremost authorities uh, on, on Leonardo and has published prolifically on him. And a selection of his most recent books um, can, be, uh, can be bought outside um, after, the event, after this event, um, including a, a wonderful memoir, which I, a kind of memoir, um, of, uh, um, which I really can recommend, called Living with Leonardo. Um, and I think, um, I don't know if Martin's here, but I think he might be prepared to sign um, the books as well, if you want him to sign, sign the books. Um, but he's also written more widely and more generally on the relations between art and science, um, and also on Dante. One of his most recent books is called Heavenly Visions, and again, um, adopts very interestingly a scientific approach um, by using the science of optics. Before I leave the stage uh, to Martin and Ruth, um, two housekeeping notices. Um, please turn off mobile phones or put them on silent. Sudden ringtones and other notifications can be very distracting for the audience and more importantly for the performers. And two, still on the theme of intrusive noises, if the fire alarm goes off, and I hope it won't, but if it does, please just take the, the green fire exit signs to go out and down into the, the forecourt, the piazza outside. Okay, I'll hand over to um, Martin and Ruth. Thanks very much. Leonardo was passing Santa Trinita by the benches of the Palazzo Spini, where several worthy men were assembled and where they were debating a passage in Dante. They called Leonardo, asking him to come and tell them about this passage. 
At that moment, it happened that Michelangelo was passing, and one of the crowd calling to him, Leonardo responded, Michelangelo will be able to tell you. To which Michelangelo, thinking this had been said to trap him, replied, no, you explain. You, who have undertaken the design of a horse to be cast in bronze, but were unable to cast it. And so saying, he turned his back on them and left. Leonardo remained there, blushing. And then, wishing to sting Leonardo, Michelangelo called out, and to think you were believed by those Milanese capons. That's an anonymous account, and now attributed to Bernardo Vecchietti, who is one of the literati at the court of Cosimo il Primo. And if it isn't a direct sort of uh, direct verbatim account of what happened, was credible, and it was very much seen at the time the en enmity between Leonardo and, uh, and Michelangelo, particularly on Michelangelo's part. Uh, what I've done there, just to explain what, what the images I'm getting up. Um, the horse is the Sforza horse, which Leonardo was doing for Ludovico Il Moro, his patron in Milan, of, of Ludovico's father. And for a whole variety of reasons, it didn't come off. These are drawings, the, the very beautiful drawing of the horse proportion and a drawing of the, the, the furnaces to cast this absolute monster. It had been an incredibly difficult job to do. Anyway, the failure of that horse was obviously known back in Florence and was, was kind of notorious. Leonardo was, of course, notorious for not always finishing things. I should say what I've done in this introductory slide is to collage things from Horace Vernet, French 19th century artist who specialized in these things. So, um, and it was outside the Santa Trinita, which is the church on the right, um, the Palazzo Spini, which is now Ferragamo Shoes, with the Ferragamo Museum underneath, which tells, tells about the changing eras. <laughs> we begin with a series of texts about Leonardo, nature, and experience. Leonardo emphasized the whole time that it was experience, nature, this is where the key lay, and this is what you had to do very directly. This is the Star of Bethlehem, um, I think one of the most beautiful plant drawings of any period by any, anyone. But this will stand for Leonardo's intensity of scrutiny of nature uh, while Ruth regales some of the texts. We now rather expect artists to write, but it's very unusual. Leonardo and Michelangelo are the first ones we've got big literary legacies for. And it seems an obvious thing that, to expect. Somebody like Donatello is obviously wonderfully interesting uh, we've got no, no real verbatim documents at all. So this is a great privilege suddenly to have two people, one born in 1475, Michelangelo, one born in 1452, who have these substantial legacies, very different ones. Leonardo is writing about his art, he's writing about science, and he does almost nothing that's personal. There are thousands and thousands of pages of notes. He recalls his father's death as if he's writing in the Libro Dei Morti, just writing a formal, formal record of his father's death. He's very private, very guarded in that respect. Michelangelo, on the other hand, is very open, very fiery, writing poetry, and as we will see, some pretty coruscating, pretty coruscating letters. Study me, reader if you find delight in me, because on very few occasions shall I return to the world, and because the patience for this profession is found in very few, and only in those who wish to compose things anew. Come, O oh men, and see the miracles that such studies will disclose in nature. I know well, not being a man of letters, it will appear to some presumptuous people that they can reasonably belabor me with the allegation that I am a man without learning. Foolish people, do they not know that I might reply as Marius did to the Roman patricians by saying that 
They who adorn themselves with the labors of others do not wish to concede me my own. They will say that since I do not have literary learning, I cannot possibly express the things I wish to treat. They do not grasp that my concerns are better handled through experience rather than bookishness. Though I may not know like them how to cite from authors, I will cite something far more worthy, quoting experience, mistress of their masters. These very people go about inflated and pompous, clothed and adorned, not with their own labors, but with those of others. If they disparage me as an inventor, how much more they, who never invented anything but are trumpeters of the works of others, are open to criticism. Moreover, those men who are inventors are interpreters of nature. And when those men are compared to the trumpeters of the works of others, they should be judged and appraised in relation to each other in no other way than the object in front of a mirror may be judged to surpass its reflection. For the former is actually something, and the other, nothing. People who are little reliant upon nature are dressed in borrowed clothes without which I would rank them with herds of beasts. If you scorn painting, which is the sole imitator of all the manifest works of nature, you will certainly be scorning a subtle invention which, with philosophical and subtle speculation, considers all manner of forms. Sea, land, trees, animals, grasses, flowers, all of which are enveloped in light and shade. Truly, this is science, the legitimate daughter of nature, because painting is born of that nature. But to be more correct, we should say the granddaughter of nature because all visible things have been brought forth by nature and it's among these that painting is born. Therefore, we may justly speak of it as the granddaughter of nature and kin of God. The eye, which is said to be the window of the soul, is the primary means by which the sensus commonness of the brain may most fully and magnificently contemplate the infinite works of nature. And the ear is the second, acquiring nobility through the recounting of things which the eye has seen. If you, historians, poets, or mathematicians, had not seen things through your own eyes, then you would only be able to report them very feebly in your writings. And you, poet, should you wish to depict a story as if painting with your pen, well, the painter with his brush will more likely succeed and will be understood less laboriously. And if you assert that painting is dumb poetry, then the painter may call poetry blind painting. It may be said, therefore, that poetry is the science that serves as the preeminent medium for the blind, and painting does the same for the deaf. But painting remains the worthier inasmuch as it serves the nobler sense and remakes the forms and figures of nature with greater truth than the poet. A vertical section of the human brain, he later cast the ventricles where he thought, as all, everyone did, mental activity occurred. He cast them and got the shape of them right, but the, the basic operation is the same. And the way it works in Leonardo's system is you've got a three flask system. You've got the imprensiva, the receptor of, of, of impressions. You've got the central one, which contains almost all the important mental, mental activities 
intellect, imagination, voluntary motion, involuntary motion. That central one is the, is the one that drives the body and receives all the sensory information in. The, the, the third one is memory. So you've got a storage flask at the end of the system. This is a very standard sort of post-Aristotelian medieval view of the, uh, of the ventricles. Grey matter doesn't look very promising. Anyone who dissected a brain will know that the grey matter without staining um, looks just as if it's, it's, it's a kind of amorphous jelly. So it's not a t totally daft idea. Uh, in this case, he's made the eye almost as an extrusion of the surface of the brain. So the meninges, as it were, go out and form the eye with this, uh, the, the central, the, the, the spherical um, lens or aqua, uh, crystalline humor, as it was called. Um, if you dissect an eye and you detention it, the, the lens goes pretty spherical. <coughs> I dissected a cat when I was doing A-level biology and it, uh, its eye went perfectly spherical. Um, human material is rather more difficult to test. But um. So this brings us on to the Paragoni, his comparison of the arts. It is Leonardo who I think invents it in its modern form. He's looking at sculpture, he's looking at poetry, he's looking at music and he's looking at Music, sculpture, painting, and literature and poetry. Um, and that particular four-cornered Paragoni comparison of the arts, I think, was invented by Leonardo at the Sforza court. There had been earlier Paragonis ranging across various subjects, but this was Leonardo's way of doing it. And the point I'm going to make with the Paragoni is looking at a particular episode recorded by Leonardo, again, probably not absolutely verbatim documentary truth, but um, carries a kind of truth. And this is concerns Matthias Corvinus, the king of Hungary, a fully-fledged Renaissance king. Um, he's portrayed on the right there in a, by an Italian artist. Uh, Hungary was operating a, a Renaissance court in the same way in which uh, other ones was, Renaissance was spreading to other major cities in Europe. And the, the anecdote relates to a portrait of a beloved lady. And in this case, we've got the Cecilia Gallerani from Krakow in a digitally restored version. This is not Photoshop. This is using pigment analysis and so on to, to, dis, uh, to, do it, um, to display it in, in a restored form. It's very effective, I think. I use it quite a lot. It, it gives a sense of vividness and communication, which uh, the weather, more weathered picture hasn't. Anyway, this is King Matthias. On King Matthias's birthday, a poet had brought him a work made to commemorate the day on which the king was gifted to the world. When a painter presented him with a portrait of his beloved lady, immediately the king closed the book of the poet and turned to the picture fixing his gaze upon it with great admiration. Whereupon the poet very indignantly said, well, read, O king, read. You'll discover something of greater consequence than a dumb painting. The king, on hearing the accusation that he was giving credence to dumb objects, said, be silent, O poet. You do not know what you're saying. This picture serves a greater sense than yours, which is for the blind. Give me something I can see and touch and not only hear. And do not criticize my decision to tuck your work under my arm while I take up that of the painter in both hands to place it before my eyes because my hands acted spontaneously in serving the nobler sense. And this is not hearing. The sculptor undertakes his work with greater bodily exertion than the painter, and the painter undertakes his work with greater mental exertion. The truth of this is evident in that the sculptor 
when making his work, uses the strength of his arm in hammering to remove the superfluous marble or other stone which surrounds the figure embedded within the stone. This is an extremely mechanical operation, generally accompanied by great sweat which mingles with dust and becomes converted into mud. His face becomes plastered and powdered all over with marble dust, which makes him look like a baker. And he becomes covered in minute chips of marble, which make him look as if he's covered in snow. His house is in a mess and covered in chips and dust from the stone. The exact reverse is true of the painter, speaking of painters and sculptors of the highest ability because the painter sits before his work at the greatest of ease, well-dressed and applying delicate colors with his light brush. And he may dress himself in whatever clothes he pleases. His residence is clean and filled with delightful pictures. And he often enjoys the accompaniment of music or the company of authors of various fine works which can be heard with great pleasure without the crashing of hammers and other confused noises. The images there are obviously the Michelangelo captives, which are stony and remind us of the terrific labor in extracting Michelangelo's figures from these, these wonderful blocks of marble. The Italians call these blocks of marble figure. They're, they're, they're blocks for figures, and the really good ones are rather rare to capture an image by Leonardo, a painter at his easel. This is the best I could do. This is a draftsman drawing an armillary sphere on a transparent plane. It's an intellectual activity, very obviously. And uh, uh, the, yeah, the, it's, it's for style and, uh, and uh, a sense of intellectual achievement, which is very different from what he's propositing for the, the sculptor. Anyway, the, the, the little drawing is from the Cote Atlantico is not ideal, but it does a job, I think, in this, in this context. Leonardo's great claim for painting is it does everything. All aspects of the natural world, all the areas of experience. And the art of painting embraces and contains within itself all visible things. It is the poverty of sculpture that it cannot do this. The painter shows to you different distances and the variations of color arising from the air interposed between the objects and the eye. Also, the mists through which the images of the objects penetrate with difficulty. Also, the rains behind which can be discerned the cloudy mountains and valleys. Uh, Mona Lisa there, this again is digitally restored. It's Pascal Cotte in Paris who does these. And uh, no, I, I like them, I have a vivid, vividness. Obviously I don't substitute for the, the real thing, but uh, in this context I think they work rather nicely. And uh, the the study of light upon balls coming through window, uh, just one of the very, very many aspects of the science of art which, uh, which Leonardo operates. But there is also the power of the image. This image has the power rather like Beatrice and Dante's Paradiso, the beloved lady who has this super attractive power but in a kind of ambiguous and somewhat withdrawn way, in this very tantalizing way. And a passage which is less often noted, but I think is very important for Leonardo. Do we not see pictures representing the divine beings constantly kept under coverlets of the greatest price? And whenever they are unveiled, there is first great ecclesiastical solemnity with much hymn singing, and then at the moment of unveiling, the great multitude of people who have gathered there immediately throw themselves to the ground, worshiping and praying to the deity who is represented in the picture, 
for the repairing of their lost health and for their eternal salvation, exactly as if this goddess were there as a living presence. This does not happen with any other science or other works of man. I particularly like that quote because it, it gives the sense of the urgent engagement with religious images, which is easy to play down with Leonardo, but I think is, a, is very much there. And at the end of the talk, I'll actually be coming back to look at the Salvato Mundi with Michelangelo so that this is a, a, a taster of what is to come. And drawn on by my ardent desire, impatient to see the great abundance of strange and varied forms created by that artificer, nature, I wandered for some distance and time among the shadowed and overhanging rocks. I came to the mouth of a huge cave before which I stopped for a moment, stupefied having been unaware of its existence. My back bent, I rested my left hand on my knee, and with my right, I made a shade over my lowered and contracted eyebrows. Several times I leaned to one side and then the other to see if I could distinguish anything. But the great darkness inside made this impossible. And after remaining there for a time, suddenly there arose within me two emotions, fear and desire, fear of the dark and menacing cave, desire to see whether some marvelous thing might be therein. In taking this down to images of actual pictures, we'll look at, we'll look at uh, first of all, at the, at the Last Supper, and particularly about the hands, the quotations are about the hands. And these, are, these are speaking hands, and there's this wonderful orchestration across the, the width of the Last Supper of these hands doing these eloquent things. One who was drinking has left his glass in its place and turned his head towards the speaker. Another wrings the fingers of his hands and turns with a frown to his companion. Another, with hands spread open to show the palms, shrugs his shoulders up to his ears and mouths astonishment. Another speaks into his neighbor's ear and the listener twists his body round to him and lends his ear while holding a knife in one hand and in the other some bread half cut through with a knife. Another, while turning round with a knife in his hand, upsets a glass over the table with that hand. Another places his hands upon the table and stares. Another splutters over his food. Another leans forward to see the speaker and shades his eyes with his hand. Another draws back behind the one who inclines forward and has sight of the speaker between the wall and the leaning man. Leonardo would have been an absolutely wonderful maker of storyboards for films. Um, I wrote an essay for a Japanese exhibition which included the Battle of Angiari and I wrote up the battle as a storyboard for a film using his own account. And there, is, there is a sense that what he could do with painting was always frustrating in a way. There was more there that he thought he could do. People often ask uh, in questions, what do you think Leonardo would be doing now? And I said, well, it's very difficult to answer in such a different context, but he would certainly be working on moving images. You get the feeling with the drawings often. He looks at them and says, come on, move. There's that ter terrific sense. And the Battle of Angiari, uh, which we'll be looking at ag uh, again. Um, here I've collaged in a bit of the deluge drawing at the top for reasons which will become clear. How to represent a battle. You must first represent the smoke from the artillery mingled in the air 
with the dust stirred up by the movement of the horses and the combatants, realize the mingling effect as follows. Dust, being composed of earth, has weight. And although, on account of its fineness, it will rise easily to mingle with the air, it nonetheless is eager to resettle. The finest particles attain the highest reaches, and consequently, there it will be least visible and will seem almost to have the color of the air. The more the smoke mingling with the dust-impregnated air rises to a certain height, the more it will have the appearance of a dark cloud. Show the victors running with their hair and other lightweight things strewn to the wind and their brows lowered. Have them thrusting their opposite limbs forward. That is, if a man puts forward his right foot, his left arm should also come forward. And if you show one who has fallen, indicate the spot where he has slithered in the dust turned into blood-stained mire. And all around, in the semi-liquid earth, show the imprints of the men and horses who have trampled over it. Show a horse dragging its dead master, leaving behind it the tracks where the corpse has been hauled through the dust and mud. Make the conquered and beaten pale, with their brows knit high, and let the skin above be heavily furrowed with pain. Yeah, the storyboard for a film, it's a, amazingly vivid, yet always you get this analytical thing that he says, you know, you get the leg moving and the opposite leg moves. There's always that sense of, in this passionate writing, of going, making sure the physics of it is correct, that the, the, the figures are working as they actually should be. Um, this brings us on to Michelangelo, he's obviously the rival of uh, Leonardo in this respect. I'm going to be saying more about that. But anyway, this is Michelangelo and this is his reply to Leonardo in the Paragonic. It comes from Benedetto Varchi, who again is one of the intellectuals at the court of Cosimo il Primo, um, a man deeply versed in the visual arts. And Benedetto Varchi writes around to a whole series of artists asking their opinion on the Paragoni, upon the comparison of the arts. Bronzino and various other people are written too. Leonardo has died by this time, but Michelangelo replies interestingly to Varchi, and along the way gives Leonardo quite a beating. I shall reply briefly to what you ask, though I'm ignorant of these matters. For me, then, painting may be considered better the more it approaches relief and relief may be considered worse the more it approaches painting. And so I used to believe that sculpture is the lamp of painting and the first related to the second as the sun to the moon. Now, having read your treatise where you state that in philosophical terms things that have the same end are the same, I've changed my opinion. I now say, that if better judgment used to surmount greater difficulties, obstacles, and toil does not produce nobler results, then painting and sculpture are the same. And if this is so, every painter should do as much sculpture as painting, and every sculptor as much painting as sculpture. I mean by sculpture, work which is fashioned by dint of taking away what is done by way of adding is similar to painting. But it's enough that both sculpture and painting spring from the same intellect and so can make their peace the one with the other and put all these disputes behind them. For some more time is spent on such dispute than on fashioning the figures themselves. As for the one who said that painting was nobler than sculpture, if he had understood as little about these other things he wrote about, my servant girl would have written about them better. I'm so sorry. Are you not hearing it properly? Okay. 
Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Michelangelo, you've got this extraordinary cache of letters, um, 1,400 letters and 500 of which are in his own hand. It's the, it, he was a great correspondent, um, very lively and a professional complainer. <laughs> it's the mo one of the most artful and potent complainers I've encountered in any kind of literature. And th this is Michelangelo about the Sistine ceiling, which he was on the way to painting. This comes of dangling from the ceiling. I'm goitered like a Lombard cat, or wherever else their throats grow fat. It's my belly that's beyond concealing. It hangs beneath my chin like peeling. My beard points skyward. I seem a bat upon its back. I have breasts and splat on my face, the paints congealing. Loins concertinaed in my gut. I drop a butt as counterweight and move without the help of eyes. Like a skinned martyr, I abut on air and wrinkled show my fate. Like a Syrian bow, I strain towards the skies. No wonder then I size things crookedly. I'm on all fours. Bent blowpipes send their darts off course. Defend my labor's cause, good Giovanni, from all strictures. This is not heaven, though I paint its pictures. Uh, just a brief excursus, because the rivalry between Michelangelo and Leonardo is not just literary, it's not just on paper, it's a real one. And I'm going to look briefly at what I call two collisions, one a minor collision and the other one a major collision. Uh, the minor collision is the David, the sculpture of David, which the Florentine authorities set up a panel, a uh, kind of inquiry to say where should it go, it was originally intended for one of the buttresses of the cathedral, but um, it obviously was not going to be put up there, sort of 40, 50 feet above ground. And Leonardo served on the, on the, the, the panel that was asked to make recommendations. Um, they didn't accept the recommendations the panel made, but that's life. That's how things go in these cases. And there was a dispute as to whether it should go in the Loggia dei Lanci, which Leonardo favoured, or whether it should go in front of the front of the palace. One of the advocates in the palace said it should replace the Donatello, Judith and Holofernes because it is not fitting that we should have an image of a woman triumphing over a man. That was, that was the herald um, of Florence, which is, um, he was the only one who expressed that view. But uh, any, anyway, they, it, went, it went outside the, uh, outside the Palazzo Vecchio, as it's now called the Palazzo dei Signori, as it was then called. And Michelangelo, uh, Leonardo does his own drawing of it. He thickens up the man, uh, David, so he becomes a more Herculean figure. And he puts se seemingly seahorses around thinking he'd make a good Neptune. But something that's not normally noticed is that the, the sling is actually hanging down from, from, the, from David's ha hanging hand. And that's how slings work. In the statue itself, Michelangelo's sling is absolutely not operable at all. It's a piece of leather or, or material, but there's no way you can make a sling out of that. Um, it's an indication of how abstracted he is, in a sense, from these, these immediate naturalistic images. Um, just an excursus on, on, the, on the sling. This is Castagno, the, the leather shield, and has got a very good... Um, sling. The way it works is you have a, a, a coiled braided rope which you hook over a, a finger. You then have a pouch with the stone in it. You then have another bit of braided string which comes up and goes between your finger and thumb. And you whirl it round very fast till you've got great speed. You release that and it goes fuck, chunk. And that's how, that's how it works. He's, Michelangelo hasn't followed any of that in terms of the description of how a sling works. Now, what would Michelangelo, what would Leonardo have done? He'd have spent a long time working out how to do an improved sling. <laughs> he, 
he probably wouldn't have started the work, of the, the sculpture at all. <laughs> the second collision, this is Ralph Steadman, the great cartoonist, um, envisaging Michelangelo and Leonardo painting in the, in the council hall in Florence. Um, not incredibly um, accurate in documentary terms, but I think a, a, a very potent conjuring up of things. That's from <coughs> Stedman's I, Leonardo. Um, he painted Leonardo's Last Supper on, the, on his bedroom wall. And I gather he's now divorced. <laughs> Yeah, just to remind ourselves about the battle, uh, about the uh, Sala del Cinquecento, as it later, later is called. I'm reasonably convinced that the documentation that the, the Battle of Cascina was on the left and the Battle of Anghiari on the right, the, Le, the Michelangelo and Leonardo, um, an altarpiece to be painted by Fra Bartolomeo, never finished, but you see it there, and a statue of Christ, which would be on the lodger of the of the Gonfalonieri, the standard bearer of Florence, by Andrea Sansovino. This is another Christ from the baptistry, but if completed, it would have been the major Florentine figures operating at their, their most spectacular level. Slight delay on the, on the signal for some reason. No, this actually does seem to be getting stuck. I don't know if something could be done about that. I thought it was a delay no, on the slide. Sound. No. Good song. Uh, okay, it's made it. Yeah, f f for these two great battle pictures, we've got copies. Uh, the one on the right is a 16th century drawing reworked by Rubens, which I, I much like because it's got such a genuine Leonardo spirit of <coughs> this beastly madness as he describes war. And the Michelangelo in Aristotele de San Gallo, the monochrome painting at, uh, at Holcomb. And it occurs to me that this is where Leonardo really looked hard at Michelangelo's figure style. And he has a warning about what an anatomical painter can do. Yeah. It is necessary to know in diverse motions and forces, which cord or muscle is the cause of such motion, and only to make these evident and swollen, and not the others, like many who, in order to appear as great draftsmen, make their nudes wooden and without grace, so that they seem to look like a sack of nuts, rather than the surface of a human being, or indeed a bundle of radishes, rather than muscular nudes. Difficult to hear that without thinking about Leonardo, and I haven't resisted the temptation to put the great Goltzius study, Goltzius, the great late, nine, late 16th century printmaker and painter, his Hercules, which is a most wonderful caricature of the Michelangelo style. Um, Anyway, it may be that Leonardo was generating this independently of Michelangelo, but I rather, rather doubt it. Uh, a lot of the letters are about his business dealings, and he took, undertook huge projects. The tomb of Pope Julius II, a huge, huge, ambitious project for New St. Peter's, which was going to be a completely freestanding tomb into which you could walk. An absolutely enormous project. And... Uh, it gave him continual problems. The, the Julius II died. The Della Rovere heirs tried to get Michelangelo to finish the tomb at the same time as the Medici, of course, the new Pope Leo X, who's Medici are pr pressing to get a work out of Michelangelo. He was well paid for doing what he was doing. He, he, made, he got distinctly rich and invested in property, which is what painters did if they got any, any money at all. Uh, but it was, a, it was a fairly tragic thing. We would just read out, just to give a flavour of it, something of the, the business aspects of doing the Julius tomb. As for the matters to so, do with Julius, 
I shall be happy to make a tomb like that of Pius in St. Peter's, as you suggested in writing to me, to have it done here, little by little, now one thing and now another, and to pay for it out of my own pocket, provided I have the salary and keep the house as you wrote, namely the house where I was in Rome, with the marble and other contents, and also provided that I don't have to give anything, that's to say to the heirs of Pope Julius, to disengage myself from his tomb, other than what I've undertaken to give them so far, the tomb I mentioned, like that of Pope Pius in St. Peter's. And then, let a reasonable time be set for doing it, and I shall make the figures with my own hand. And if I am given my salary, as I said, I shall never stop working for Pope Clement with all the strength I have, though it doesn't amount to much as I'm old. And also, I must not go on being taunted the way I am, because this affects me deeply, and it has stopped me from doing what I want these many months, for one cannot work on something with one's hands and on something else with one's brain, especially when it comes to marble. Here it is said that it's being done to spur me on, but I tell you, they are poor spurs which force one back. I have not drawn my salary for a year now. I'm struggling with poverty. I am all very much alone with my worries, and there are so many of them that they occupy me more than my art, as I cannot keep anyone to look after my affairs since I haven't the means. Very strong letters, and there are, there are a, lot, a lot like that. Fatucci is this is addressed to back in Florence, who's his business manager in Florence, and he's sending money through, he's buying property and so on. Fatucci does an extremely good job of looking after Michelangelo's interests. What we have there is the, the final tomb for Pope Julius in, uh, in San Pietro in Vincoli, not in St. Peter's at all, um, with the great Moses and the rest made up well, but you can see the tomb of Pius the, sec the third on the right, and in a sense you can see that this reduced version of a tomb uh, as a wall tomb is something which he takes up. And the drawing there is a late, one of the later drawings when this tomb had contracted back to basically being elevated to some up from the wall and then more or less a, a wall tomb. Uh, the tragedy of the tomb, Michelangelo called it. But he's the first artist who's under that kind of demand. Titian is under international demand, but uh, the, the pressures Michelangelo was un under from these, the big families and taking huge projects was very high. He's doing the Medici Chapel in Florence, obviously the, the new sacristy. And he had a pretty dysfunctional family to deal with. He was making a lot of money, but the family <coughs> cashed in on his money in a big way. Um, his father was uh, minor aristocracy and thought he was major aristocracy and certainly he's bothering um, Michelangelo for money. And this is a letter to Leon Leonardo Buonarroti, his nephew, not to be confused with Leonardo Leonardo. And uh, what Ruth has here is just the opening of the letter which illustrates vividly, if you, don't, if you get on the wrong side of Leonardo, you're in real trouble. Leonardo, your last letter, since I couldn't and didn't know how to read it, I threw on the fire, so I can't answer you about anything in it. I have written you several times that every time I have a letter of yours, I get a headache before I figure out how to read it. So I tell you from now on, don't write me any more. <laughs> and if you have to let me know anything, Get hold of someone who knows how to write, since I use my head for something else besides shuddering over your letters. This seems to be pretty terminal, but in fact, uh, um, Leonardo becomes a regular correspondent. He inherits the Casa Buonarroti as we now have it. So Leonardo, uh, Michelangelo goes through these apparently terminal rages with his relatives but still there is the family and he's still got to, keeps his responsibilities for the family. Um, the, 
lovely Itali Italic hand compared with Leonardo's late medieval notarial hand. Uh, Michelangelo's hand is very gracious, very beautiful. That, that is not the letter we quoted from, but it is a letter to, to Leonardo. And Daniele da Volterra is the, is the sketch. Daniele did a painted portrait and a very effective bust, which um, we saw a drawing by Daniele in the, in the title slide. Along with the agonies of dysfunctional families and uh, air, being chased by heirs, um, there are a series of letters, series of correspondence <coughs> with figures with whom he is deeply in, in, in love in some cases. And the early ones we're going to be looking at are Cavalieri, Tommaso Cavalieri. I don't have a portrait of him, but I've substituted one of the pretty young aristocratic boys that Michelangelo portrays, Andrea Quaratesi. So Quaratesi is standing in for Tommaso Cavalieri. And these are, these are quite different letters. They're quite different in feel and show Michelangelo in a very remarkable light. My dear Lord, if I did not think that I had convinced you of my very great, indeed, my boundless love for you, I would not have thought strange nor marveled at the fear you show in your letter that since I have not written to you, I might have forgotten you. But it is neither unusual nor surprising since so many things end at cross purposes that our friendship too might go wrong. And what your Lordship says to me, I would have said to you. But perhaps you did this to try me or to rekindle a greater flame in me, if it were possible. Be that as it may, I know for sure that I'll forget your name the day I forget the food I live on. Indeed, I could sooner forget my food, which sadly nourishes only the body, than your name, which nourishes body and soul, and fills both with such sweetness that I can feel no pain nor fear of death while my mind remembers it. Imagine in what a happy state I would be if my eye also had its share. With your bright eyes, I see the living light, which my blind eyes alone can never see. And your sure feet take up that load for me, which my lame gait would let fall helplessly. Wingless, but with your plumes, here I'm in flight. In your strong mind are my weak thoughts set free. And as it pleases you, I'm pale or bright, cold in the sun, hot in the winter's night. In what you wish is all that I would want. My very thoughts are framed within your heart. My words are uttered with the air you breathe. Thus, like the moon, a lonely suppliant, invisible myself, I sail apart until your sun reveals me with its beams. Uh, these are the context of these pretty young Roman aristocratic men and Tommaso Cavalieri in which he does these very remarkable presentation drawings. Um, at the top, Titius, whose punishment was to have his liver continually picked by an eagle and a very homoerotic image of uh, Jupiter disguised as, as, a, as an eagle in his customary manner, seizing Ganymede and lifting him to heaven. Uh, a very potent image physically, emotionally and, uh, and sexually. And the great <coughs> spiritual love of his later life the Marsh Vittoria Colonna, the Marchioness of Pescara. Um, her husband died quite young and she went into a convent but never took holy orders, but a woman of immense piety. 
and a, a very remarkable correspondent and friend for Michelangelo. The image on the left, a presentation drawing for Vittoria, which says they do, roughly says, they do not realize how much blood they have shared. And in the middle, the, the, the drawing of the moment where Christ says, my Lord, why hast thou, thou forsaken me? Um, images of, uh, of Vittoria Colonna by Sebastiano del Piombo, who's the friend of, Leon of Michelangelo after all, and a drawing which is billed as being of Vittoria Colonna. I'm not sure whether it is, but uh, maybe somebody knows more about it than I do. Anyway, Vittoria Colonna. How can that be, lady, which all men learn by long experience, shapes that seem alive, wrought in hard mountain marble, will survive their maker, whom the years to dust return. Thus, to effect, cause yields. Art hath her turn, and triumphs over nature. I, who strive with sculpture, know this well. Her wonders live in spite of time and death, those tyrants stern. So I can give long life to both of us, in either way, by colour or by stone, making the semblance of thy face and mine. And centuries hence, when both are buried, thus thy beauty and my sadness shall be shown. And men shall say, for her, twas wise to pine. I wanted, my lady, before accepting the things that your ladyship has so often wished to give me, to make something for you with my own hand, so that I should more deservingly receive them. And then, having seen and realized that the grace of God cannot be bought, and that to keep you waiting is a great sin, I confess my fault and gladly accept those presents. And when they arrive, I shall know I'm in paradise, not because they're in my house, but because I'll be in theirs. And then, if possible, I shall be even more obliged to your ladyship than I am now. Do you have another Victoria one? Yes. yes. <laughs> the best of artists hath no thought to show which the rough stone in its superfluous shell doth not include. To break the marble spell is all the hand that serves the brain can do. The ill I shun, the good I seek, even so in thee, fair lady, proud, ineffable, lies hidden. But the art I wield so well works adverse to my wish and lays me low. Therefore, not love, nor thy transcendent face, nor cruelty, nor fortune, nor disdain cause my mischance, nor fate, nor destiny, since in thy heart, thou carriest death and grace enclosed together. And my worthless brain can draw forth only death to feed on me. With late Michelangelo, there's a very strong sense of the decline of his body and the aging of his body and the body characterized in poems as a husk, as a shell, as something which is worthless and should be sloughed off. And he appears in the Sistine Chapel, Last Judgment in this guise, um, in the hands of, uh, of St. Bartholomew, who met his martyrdom by being flayed. The, the, the image of his Bartholomew's skin is obviously a portrait, self-portrait of, of Michelangelo. The incredibly strong sense of bodily revulsion, um, which comes through in a whole series of, of poems. Just as we put 
O lady, by subtraction, into the rough, hard stone, a living figure, grown largest wherever a rock has grown most small. Just so, sometimes, good actions for the still trembling soul are hidden by its own body's surplus and the husk that is raw and hard and coarse, which you alone can pull from off my outer surface. For in myself, I find no strength or will. And the last of the poems we're going to cite is that sent to Vasari. When, Vasari received, when Michelangelo received Vasari's Lives, the first edition in 1550, he wrote a very beautiful poem, which um, he's anticipating his, his death very shortly. This is addressed to Giorgio Vasari. Now hath my life across a stormy sea, like a frail bark, reached that wide port where all are bidden, ere the final reckoning fall of good and evil for eternity. Now know I well how that fond fantasy which made my soul the worshipper and thrall of earthly art is vain. How criminal is that which all men seek unwittingly. Those amorous thoughts which were so lightly dressed, what are they when the double death is nigh? The one I know for sure, the other dread. Painting nor sculpture now can lull to rest my soul that turns to his great love on high, whose arms to clasp us on the cross were spread. Very terrible poem that, this realization that his art, its materiality, its physicality is something which is betraying him. And the late crucifixion drawings, he's talking a great deal about Christ embracing, embracing him and him, him embracing the cross. But these are dematerialized drawings. As far as you can draw something without drawing the substance of it, he, he manages it. Um, trying to get away from how terrible the, the crucifixion is and suggesting it and allowing us our imaginations to work with these very tortured images. I remember well, so 20 years ago or so, the Michelangelo drawing exhibition at the British Museum had the set of the late crucifixion drawings and they were just extraordinary in impact. And dematerializing sculpture, the Rondonini Pietà, the arm of the previous version, there's no way you can get a sculpture out of this. It's, it's hacked away, it's pared away to as, as little as he, he can make. And as far as marble can be dematerialized, he, he manages to do this. And to finish, something which is a reconciliation, in a way, between the two men. Um, it was only working on this that it, it occurred to me there is a, a kind of reconciliation in their late work. Leonardo, in these late works, and the Sal Salvatore Mundi, I'm now convinced, is late. It's probably 1512 onwards. And the St. John the Baptist, none of the grace of the landscape, none of the seductive beauty of nature, but just intense suggestion of the otherness of spirituality. And Leonardo, towards the end of his life, holds the double truth doctrine in a very rigid way, that there's one truth you can see in nature where God's presence is declared through the beauty and systematic nature of nature, but the actual nature of divinity is completely elusive. There is no point in asking her about it.
I leave the definition of the soul to the minds of the friars, fathers of the people, who by inspiration possess the secrets. I let be the sacred writings, for they are the supreme truth. I think there's no, no irony in that. It's a perfectly responsible uh, philosophical, theological position that you can see everything you want to in nature and that testifies the goodness of God. But God, the paradiso in the sense in Dante's term, is simply inaccessible. Uh, for we, we can put the Rondonini's Pieta in that or one of these late crucifixion drawings and they're both grappling with the fact that the supreme truth is elusive, it's too far away, it's in, inaccessible. They do it in quite different ways. Leonardo does it in this rather calculated way of saying, I am conjuring up images of, of, of a spiritual nature and you can't really understand them, they're beyond understanding. Michelangelo is trying for transcendence while on the earth and is not much interested in the role of nature in this. Almost no plants in Michelangelo, almost no nature, almost no perspective, etc., etc. And I think there is a commonality of it, both in their old age, having reached this point, where they're both after the supreme truth, but neither of them can get there for different reasons. So I think there is a commonality in that, which is very profoundly similar, but profoundly different at the same time. Thank you very much.